I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello horror hounds, welcome to my horror house. It's a Saturday morning and I've literally just finished watching 1993's Body Bags. Uh, a sort of forgotten horror anthology from the 90s. I don't really hear many people speaking about it. Actually, to give it its formal title, John Carpenter Presents Body Bags. And that's a very 90s thing. This whole thing has been a sort of time travel nostalgia exercise for me. Back in the 90s, horror directors used to present a lot of things. Wes Craven presented an awful lot of stuff. Uh, Wishmaster, most famously. And here for Body Bags, John Carpenter presents Body Bags. In more ways than one, he actually is the presenter. It's an anthology very much in the mould of uh, Tales from the Crypt. And I believe the film was made for Showtime to act as sort of a pilot for a proposed ongoing anthology TV show. So the format for fans of Tales from the Crypt is going to be very familiar to people watching Carpenter himself is the host, at least for this pilot. I, I doubt very much whether he intended to continue being the host for the TV series, but you never know. He sort of plays a morgue attendant who acts and, sorry John, but kind of looks quite a lot like the Crypt Keeper as well. It's very jokey, it's very punny. We're on very, very familiar territory here. The cool little conceit is that each story in the anthology is the story of one of the corpses that arrives in a titular body bag. I think that's kind of neat. We get three stories and the anthology has a great pedigree which is also makes me scratch my head again as to why it's it's kind of forgotten. There are three segments. John Carpenter directs the first two segments. Toby Hooper directs the third segment and Carpenter provides the score throughout. So surely there's got to be something in here to enjoy, right? The first segment is called The Gas Station and is set. Anyone? Anyone? At a gas station, a lonely gas station out in the middle of nowhere where a, a young college student is arriving for her first day at work on the night shift all the way through to 7am. And wouldn't you know it, on the radio, there's talk of a madman on the loose. A serial killer has struck again. Nice little wry bit of humour from Carpenter here. He's actually struck in the nearby town of Haddonfield. And this is the kind of vibe we're going for. The tried and tested person, usually a woman, in, alone in a secluded location and on the radio there's reports of an escaped maniac. The in-joking doesn't end there. The first person to turn up at the gas station is none other than Wes Craven in a cameo playing a really creepy off-kilter kind of guy. I've got to say, Craven is clearly having a blast. He actually knocks it out of the park. He is weird and creepy, not in an overtly obvious sort of way. I actually really like what Craven's doing in this. The second person to turn up at the gas station is David Norton uh, from obviously an American Wealth in London. Sam Raimi cameos in this segment as a corpse i mean this kind of thing maybe this is, i'm just misremembering uh putting too much emphasis on it but this kind of thing seemed to happen a lot in the 90s there was this there was this period in the first half of the 90s where uh, horror directors sort of became sort of mini stars in their own right I mean, there's a segment in sleepwalkers from the year before stephen king's film where he gets all of his mates in. It's a nice little lone woman in a secluded environment, slasher segment. Carpenter's having fun with his own legacy. He's having fun with Halloween as well. There are some shots in this that recall quite directly Halloween. And that's what most of this anthology is. It's, it's, it's fun. It's light. And there's gore when there needs to be. Yeah, it, it, it was fine. It was an enjoyable opening segment. Uh, Carpenter's score in it was uh, synthy and eerie and fairly minimalistic, as you'd expect. Great. Uh, next, the second segment is called Hair, and it stars Stacy Keach as a guy who is becoming really obsessed with the fact that his hair is 
thinning. This one is played a lot more for laughs, this middle segment. It is slower than the previous segment, and I was beginning to tap my foot a little. It's kind of satirizing, I guess, the rise of the, the, the self-improvement uh, movement of uh, the 90s. He buys all of these hair products. He, he, he tries to, to thicken it. He tries to uh, volumize it. I'd say Keach is remarkably game at being the butt of the joke and, and um, really sort of having no ego about this and having his thinning hair front and center and the point of the piece and the punchline to, to an awful lot of gags in the segment. Finally, desperate, he sees an ad on television and goes to see a doctor who is promising a revolutionary new hair growth technique. The doctor is none other than the wonderful David Warner, assisted by his nurse, played by Debbie Harry. And without surgical intervention, overnight, he grows a luscious, sort of Fabio-like mane of hair. Carpenter's score throughout this is clearly drawing upon the success of Twin Peaks. There's a, an upright double bass which goes for a walk all the way through it. The brush on the drums and uh, an acid saxophone wailing away in the background. It takes us quite a long time to get to the point of this segment for the penny to drop. Uh, but when it does, it's actually really good fun. The hair grows and it doesn't stop growing and it doesn't only stop growing out of his top of his head, but his, his face as well. And then you find out that the hair is sort of autonomous and maybe sentient. I thought we were perhaps going into some Junji Ito areas of body horror, but when you actually find out what's going on, I think it's a really cool payoff. It's a funny little punchline. And the practical effects, I've got to be honest, are excellent for for hair horror. It's very much hair horror. I know there's a film called XD, which, uh, which I believe is a Japanese film, which is about sentient hair extensions. Has anyone seen that? Is that any good? Is that worth checking out? And then we're on to the third and final segment called I, which I think is probably, if people are going to go, oh, I kind of remember body bags. They're going to kind of remember most, I think, this segment, I. Not least because it stars Mark Hamill. And it's it's the most overtly horror one of them all. It's actually probably the strongest segment to my mind. Even though, again, like the first segment, it is falling back on a very tried and tested uh, anthology horror story. Hamill plays a small league baseball uh, player who is the scuttlebutt is that he's going to get signed to the big time but he has a car crash I was saying earlier how nostalgic this movie made me feel he had a car crash because he's not paying attention to the road because he's reaching over to the passenger seat to try and find a music cassette tape that he wants to play on the cassette deck in his car <laughs> it's wow that took me back seeing that way back. What I'm trying to say is I'm old. Anyway, he gets in a crash. He loses his eye and has an eye transplant. And this is a riff on the old hands of a killer scenario. Oh, the you know, the concert pianist who loses his hands in an accident has hand transplants and they're the hands of a serial killer. And he starts strangling people in his sleep. Well, this is this is exactly the same. It's going to be no big spoiler when you find out that the eye he had implanted is that of a serial killer. Hamill starts seeing things, horrible things, bodies, parts of bodies, uh, uh, bodies coming up out of the ground from uh, shallow graves in his garden. His personality starts changing. This isn't breaking any new ground. We've seen it all before. What does save it is Hamill's performance He's excellent, and when he finally goes full bore crazy, he's great. Probably a surprise for people at the time. Now people are more than used to him uh, as an excellent vocal artist and his turn as, as the Joker and the like. We, we all know now 
way late in the day that he's got all of this in him. In 1993, probably quite a shock. The practical effects throughout, especially in the morgue segments with the cadavers, have been fantastic. And the practical effects here are gruesome, slightly stomach churning. If you've got eye, eye squicks or anything like that at all, this, this one will be the segment that gives you the heebie-jeebies. The practical effects here are great. There is a genuinely shocking sex scene and all the themes uh, underpinning this sort of overt religiosity, uh, serial murder, necrophilia plays well into Toby Hooper's wheelhouse. And I just think everyone here again is having a great time. This is the segment that's got the shocks. This is the segment that's got the, the sort of the power, the muscle behind it. Not a surprise that this would be the segment that people remember the most. Oh, and you know, just more bang for your buck. This segment's got a cameo by Roger Corman in it as well. It was made for Showtime. It's clearly made for TV. It's got that 90s made for TV aesthetic. Made for TV nowadays doesn't, doesn't really mean anything made for streaming. The production value of that kind of stuff is just as good as what you'd see in the cinema. In the 90s, not so. The, I mean, the host segment, what, one of the other things that dates this incredibly is that um, in the background of the host segments, you've got that um, red and green neon wash lighting, which was all over this, all over um, Freddy's Nightmares and the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, movies at the time. I mean, you can't get much more 90s than that. The pacing is off a little bit. It, it does drag in certain segments to uh, to fill out the, the feature length format. I don't know if the idea was for that to have been uh, tightened up if the thing ever went to series and for each episode to be only one story or maybe two stories. I, I don't know and um, it, it never got commissioned. So yeah, it's, it, it's a fun hyper nostalgic uh, showcase for great practical special effects that has a little bit of teeth towards the end. Might have you checking your phone uh, throughout these days if you want to check it out. It's not great. I can, I, I can kind of see why it has been kind of forgotten, even with all the talent that's brought to bear on it. It's by no means awful. Absolutely saved, I think, by a wicked dark sense of humour. John Carpenter is the host, gleefully macabre, and Hamill knocking it out of the park, and Toby Hooper giving us a pretty damn gruesome finale to the third story. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs>